Dutch Fairy Tales for Young Folks by William Elliot Griffiths The Goblins Turn to Stone When the cow came to Holland, the Dutch folks had more and better things to eat. Fields of wheat and rye took the place of forests. Instead of acorns and the meat of wild game, they now enjoyed milk and bread. The youngsters made pets of the calves, and all the family lived under one roof. The cows had a happy time of it, because they were kept so clean, fed well, milked regularly, and cared for in winter. By and by the Dutch learned to make cheese, and began to eat it every day. They liked it, whether it was raw, cooked, toasted, sliced, or in chunks or served with other good things. Even the foxes and wild creatures were very fond of the smell and taste of toasted cheese. They came at night close to the houses, often stealing the cheese out of the pantry. When a fox would not, or could not, be caught in a trap by any other bait, a bit of cooked cheese would allure him so that he was caught and his fur made use of. When the people could not get meat or fish, they had toasted bread and cheese, which in Dutch is her roasted brot met kaas. Then they laughed, and named the new dish after whatever they pretended it was. It was just the same as when they called goodies made out of flour and sugar, nuts, fingers, calves and lambs. Even grown folks love to play and pretend things like children. Soon it became the fashion to have cheese parties. Men and women would sit around the fire by the hour nibbling the toast that had melted cheese poured over it. But after they had gone to bed some of them dreamed. Now some dreams may be pleasant but cheese dreams were not usually of this sort. The dreamer thought that a big she-horse had climbed upon the bed and sat down upon his stomach. Once there, the beast grinned hideously, snored, and pressed its hoofs down on the sleeper's breast, so that he could not breathe or speak. The feeling was a horrible one, but, just when the dreamer expected to choke, he seemed to jump off some high place and come down somewhere, very far off. Then the animal ran away, and the terrible dream was over. This was called a nightmare, or, in Dutch, a nacht merry. Nacht means night, and merry a filly or a mare. In the dream it was not a small or a young horse, but always a big mare that squatted down on a man's stomach. In those days, instead of seeking for the trouble inside, or asking whether there was any connection between nightmares and too hearty eating of cheese, the Dutch fathers laid it all on the goblins. The goblins, or sooty elves, that used to live in Holland, were ugly, short fellows, very smart, quick in action, and able to travel far in a second. They were first cousins to the kabouters. They had big heads, green eyes, and split feet, like cows. They were so ugly that they were ordered to live underground and never come out during the day. If they did, they would be turned to stone. The goblins had a bad reputation for mischief. They liked to have fun with human beings. They would listen to the conversation of people and then mock them by repeating the last word. That is the reason why echoes were called rake clunk or dwarf's talk. Because these goblins were short, they envied men their greater stature and wanted to grow to the height of human beings. As they were not able of themselves to do this, they often sneaked into a house and snatched a child out of the cradle. In place of the stolen baby, one of their own wizened children was laid. That was the reason why many a poor little baby that grew puny and thin was called a weaselkind or changeling. When the sick baby could not get well, and medicine or care seemed to do no good, the mother thought that the goblins had taken away her own child. 
it was only the female goblins that would change themselves into nightmares and sit on the body of the dreamer they usually came in through a hole or a crack but if that person in the house could plug up the hole or stop the crack he could conquer the female goblin and do what he pleased with her if a man wanted to he could make her his wife so long as the hole was kept stopped up by which the goblin entered she made a good wife if this crack was left open or if the plug dropped out of the hole the she-goblin was off and could never be found again the ruler of the goblins lived beneath the earth as the king of the underworld his palace was made of gold and glittered with gems he had riches more than men could count all the goblins and kabouters who worked in the mines and at the forges and anvils making swords spears bells or jewels obeyed him the most wonderful things about these dwarfs was the way in which they made themselves invisible so that men were able to see neither the nightmares nor the male goblins while at their mischief this was a little red cap which every goblin possessed and which he was careful never to lose the red cap acted like a snuffer on a candle to put it out and while under it no goblin could be seen by mortal eyes now it happened that one night as a dear old lady lay dying on her bed a middle-sized goblin with his red cap on came in through a crack into the room and stood at the foot of her bed just for mischief and to frighten her by making himself visible he took off his red cap when the old lady saw the imp she cried out loudly go away go away don't you know i belong to my lord but the goblin dwarf only laughed at her with his green eyes Calling her daughter a leader, the old lady whispered in her ear, Bring me my wooden shoes. Rising up in her bed, the old lady hurled the heavy clumps, one after the other, at the goblin's head. At this he started to get out through the crack and away, but before his body was half out, a leader snatched his red cap away. Then she stuck a needle in his cloven foot that made him howl with pain. Alida looked at the crack through which he escaped and found it quite sooty. Twirling the little red cap around on her forefinger, a brilliant thought struck her. She went and told the men her plan, and they agreed to it. This was to gather hundreds of farmers and town folk, boys and men together, on the next moonlight night, and round up all the goblins in Drenta. By pulling off their caps, and holding them till the sun rose, when they would be petrified, a whole brood could be exterminated. So, knowing that the goblin would come the next night to steal back his red cap, she left a note outside the crack, telling him to bring several hundred goblins to the great moor or felt. There, at a certain hour near midnight, he would find the red cap on a bush. With his companions, he could celebrate the return of the cap, in exchange for this, she asked the goblin to bring her a gold necklace. The moonlight night came round, and hundreds of the men of Drenta gathered together. They were armed with horseshoes, and with witch hazel and other plants, which are like poison to the sooty elves. They had also bits of parchment covered with runes, a strange kind of writing, and various charms which are supposed to be harmful to goblins. It was agreed to move together in a circle towards the centre, where the Lady Alida was to hang the red cap upon a bush. Then, with a rush, the men were to snatch off all the goblins' caps, pulling and grabbing, whether they could see or even feel anything or not. The placing of the red cap upon the bush in the centre by the Lady Alida was the signal. So, when the great round-up narrowed to a small space, the men began to grab, snatch and pull, putting their hands out in the air, at the height of about a yard from the ground, they hustled and pushed hard. In a few minutes, hundreds of red caps were in their hands, and as many goblins became visible. They were, indeed, an ugly host. 
yet hundreds of other goblins escaped with their caps on and were still invisible as they broke away in groups however they were seen for in each bunch was one or more visible fellow because he was capless so the men divided into squads to chase the imps a long distance even to many distant places it was a most curious night battle here could be seen groups of men in a tussle with the goblins many more of which but by no means all were made capless and visible the racket kept up till the sky in the east was grey had all the goblins run away it would have been well with them hundreds of them did but the others were so anxious to help their fellows or to get back their own caps fearing the disgrace of returning head bare to their king and getting a good scolding that the sun suddenly rose on them before they knew it was day at the first level ray the goblins were all turned to stone the treeless desolate land which a moment before was full of struggling goblins and men became as quiet as the blue sky above nothing but some rounded rocks or stones in groups marked the spot where the bloodless battle of imps and men had been fought there these stones big and little lie to this day among the buckwheat and the potato blossoms of the summer under the shadows and clouds and whispering breezes of autumn or covered with the snows of winter they are seen on desolate heaths over some of them oak trees centuries old have grown others are near or among the farmers grain fields or not far from houses and barnyards the cows wander among them knowing nothing of their past and the goblins come no more End of the Goblins Turn to Stone